I have to apologize. It's been a really long time since we published anything on the Coral Channel website. I think it was like November. It's it's been insane. It was November that we did the sound and surf conference, yeah, right? So it's just surf. it's been insane since then. Part of the reason is I just got this new job in Temecula, California, where we just have this brand new residency. It's uh, amazing uh, being able to interact with all these new residents and just being a new system. Like honestly, just a little bit tricky. It's been complicated, but I have been able to do a lot of local sound teaching with Mike Macias, Thanks, dude. the Pocus Atlas, and we're actually teaching a course right now in Maui. That's why we're just here together. And we wanted to let you know that we are uh, doing a recording of it. We want to share it with you. We're going to show that right after this introduction. We also wanted to let you know some good news. Mike, what's the good news? Sound and Surf mm -hmm. 2021 is now available online yes. at Core Ultrasound, right? Yeah, yeah. So you go to courses.coreultrasound.com. It'll be right on there. You can access those. And I don't know. I think the lectures are really good. We have... Uh, uh, probably not. They're, I think they're international experts, but they're all like North American uh, uh, instructors, all giving instructions on there, all giving great lectures there. So make sure to check it out as soon as you watch this lecture. Mahalo. Nice. Yeah. Sorry about the audio quality for that video. It's just Mike and I were together. We were at this market in Maui and we really just wanted to share with you guys the content of this podcast that we are delivering to you guys after a very long delay. I saw that my last podcast I actually published was all the way back in November. It's been quite a busy couple of months. We have Sound and Surf 2021 actually available online. So if you go to courses.coreultrasound.com, you click on the conferences section here, that'll take you to our course. It was an amazingly fun course. So happy to do stuff in person. Again, we have three days of content, some amazing and super fun lectures. Here are the little bios. But go here, check it out, and if you have any more questions on it, please feel free to reach out. In the meantime, check out the podcast and let me know what you think. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Yeah, we can definitely do that, or we could be better clinicians and use our ultrasound. All right, um, who has experience doing like uh, vascular access already? Sick, all right. Uh, peripheral IVs or just central lines? You have experience, fair enough. Uh, are we talking uh, central lines and IVs? Both, okay. Who's never tried to do it before? Just out of curiosity. Okay, so we have like some level of like at least uh, familiarity with it, excellent. Um, so Mike and I actually been talking about doing like a full like a full day course of vascular access because there's like so much literature behind it and so many like nuances that we've picked up the years that we've been doing this. Um, but I'm gonna condense it into like, it's like 30 minutes, um, just to give you guys the things that you need to know. This is the first thing. This guy does not need an ultrasound guided <laughs> IV, right? I mean, you could just like throw an IV from across the room and you probably get something back, right? And that's important, ultrasound guided IVs don't do well in all comers. They only do well in difficult IV access patients. We're talking this guy, right? <laughs> the guy that probably has great veins, but they're just like two to three centimeters deep. You can't see them, you can't palpate them. This is the ultrasound guided IV perfect patient. I mean, we all see stories like this, right? This is like, I just found this on Reddit one day when I was like browsing, you know, wasting time basically. But I did find something for this lecture. Um, and it's just like a guy's bruised arm because, you know, for whatever reason, difficult IV access. Um, and we've been in that situation, at least I have, where nurses say, hey, I've tried eight times on this patient. I don't know what to do. And it's like, if you just told me two in, we could have gotten it on the third try, right? Mm -hmm. um, and also there's this. I mean, this is a this is a type one diabetic that I had when I was in residency. Um, now, ultrasound guided IV was kind of like starting to become more of a thing when I was a resident. I put twice, I put a central line in somebody, took it out and discharged them because we couldn't get IV access before this was like a thing. And this was a type one diabetic that came in and this was her neck. This is the left and the right side of her neck. So that's all the IJ she's gotten because the small lady didn't really have any peripheral IVs. They had, they thought they had no other options but to place these central lines. So these are our good patients, not just the, the fluffy patient, but also any patient that has difficult IV access. For me and in the literature, a difficult IV access patient is two to three attempts, don't get an IV. 
That's basically when they fall into the category of ultrasound guided IV doing better. There's a lot of literature behind ultrasound guided IVs, ultrasound guided central lines and art lines, basically like vascular access with ultrasound. A lot of literature behind it, but I'm gonna summarize it in basically one slide. For central lines, invariably, the literature demonstrates that ultrasound is better than landmark guidance with regards to first pass success, overall success, and complication rates. Sure, if you have a, you know, a, a surgeon who has placed 7,000 subclavians and they start off by their first ultrasound guided subclavian, that person's landmark subclavian is going to be more successful than his first try with an ultrasound guided, right? So this is with appropriate training, equal amounts of training, the ultrasound does better. You have to get to that right training spot. With arterial lines, some of the studies say that ultrasound's better, some of them say landmark is better. I think, even though the literature doesn't clearly delineate this, I think that it is the patient that has you know, a bit of tissue between the skin and that artery. That's where ultrasound guided arterial lines do well. And then for peripheral lines, if you do all comers, ultrasound guided IV takes longer and you might not have as good as this x-ray, but for difficult IV access patients, those are the patients in which ultrasound invariably does better. They've actually done a couple of studies where they just ultrasound guided IV versus landmark guided IV, everybody in the ER, all comers, right? Even like people that don't need it. And they found that ultrasound guided IV does not do better in that situation. Not for all comers, just for difficult IV access patients. All right, three steps, right? We gotta make sure that we have the right equipment. We gotta make sure that we have prepped the patient, gotten everything together, and then there's performing it. This is my setup when I do an ultrasound guide IV. Now this is a regular IV kit with a couple of extra things. And Mike and I have this debate actually pretty frequently with exactly like what we need to do. So IV kit, we know this, we know this, we know this. All this is regular, right? The extra thing is the extra tegaderm, the gel, and the gel. Now what I like to do is I like to actually put a tegaderm on the transducer itself. There's a, actually a pretty big debate within the academic community as to if you need that tegaderm or not because the tegaderm, super tiny viruses can actually pass through the tegaderm, right? Super, super tiny viruses. But the vast majority of bloodborne pathogens are protected if you put a tegaderm on the transducer. On the other hand, you can put a gray wipe and most places, if you put a gray wipe and actually make sure that you have the appropriate dwell time, this is on the transducer. So that's three minutes for the gray wipes. That is considered intermediate level disinfection. So low level is like an alcohol swab. Intermediate is gray wipes or purple wipes. And then high level is like putting it in that like bath that we do for the endocavitary transducers. So there's some places, I know UVM, the University of Vermont, they actually don't, their infectious disease people have signed off on not needing tegaderms to make sure that the, it's safe for patients. All they, they ask is that we put a gray wipe, they put a gray wipe on top and leave it on for three minutes. If they do that, it's considered clean and they don't need a tegaderm. Personally, I like using the tegaderm on the transducer because it makes cleanup so much easier. Because if I happen to get blood on the transducer, I just take the tegaderm off and it's clean. And for me, it feels like a little bit safer. So you can plus or minus the tegaderm. I use a tegaderm. This is debatable. Now, if you're gonna use the tegaderm, what you can do is, and I'll have a video about it later, you can actually um, put a little layer of gel on the inside. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, of a technique. So you don't have to do it, but it is an option. All right, step one is gonna be gather the equipment, which we already talked about. Step two, and this is a little different from how we might think about regular IV placement. I apply the tourniquet first. Before I even look at the patient, before I do anything, I apply the tourniquet first because I want those blood vessels to get big for me. I actually looked this up recently. Do you guys know what like the uh, recommendations are for tourniquets? Like actual like, you know, they have arterial bleeding tourniquets, like what most of like the European society and the American society say for how long tourniquets can stay up. Any ideas? Yeah, like two to four hours. That's the European one. And the American ones just say like, just don't put it on too long. That's literally what like the American guidelines say. Like, because like the thing is like tourniquets and stay on, you take it off and it's okay. So if you leave the IV tourniquet on for like two minutes, it's fine. It's not a problem. You're not gonna cause any long-term damage. So that's my first step. Then I put the tourniquet high up. I clean the entire arm as my second step. Then I look for a vein after I've prepped my transducer and then I'll cannulate. I found that this saves me the most time. So here's an example of how I actually put that tourniquet on. So I put it all the way up here, right underneath the deltoid. And I always tell the patients, hey, I'm gonna do this really tight because I want those veins to get nice and big for me. They're usually okay with it. So put it on tight right underneath the deltoid and then I clean everywhere underneath that. Now I talked about the transducer, the, the transducer itself. You don't have to do this step. 
I like doing this step. You put a little layer, and this does not have to be the sterile gel at all. You put a tiny layer on the uh, face of the transducer, the very end of the transducer. And then I would use a large non-textured tegaderm because uh, you have a texture that's like more likely to kind of trap air in between them. So a large non-textured one, put it here, and then just slide that thing over with a gel on the inside. What's important here is that if you have bubbles right here in this area, you're kind of tempted to smooth it with your fingers. If you do that, you've, you've like, why even use a tegaderm? Because now you put like your dirty finger. I mean, it's not dirty, but you know what I mean? Like not sterile finger over top of it. So don't smooth it out with your fingers if you're gonna use that. Now let's talk about vein selection. Now in the forearm, there are so many veins, right? In the forearm, so I don't even like name them. But I will say, especially in the fluffy patient, I always look in the forearm first. Cause you'd be surprised. There'll be like nurses come and they say, or whomever's like asking you for your help for this, they'll say like, there's nothing, I can't find anything. And these kind of fluffier patients, you look in the forearm and you can put a 14 in their forearm because their veins are so big. Cause right, all that extra adipose tissue actually needs blood flow, right? So the veins actually will get bigger for you. Especially in uh, fluffy patients, always look in the forearm first. But what we're gonna focus on is there's no forearm veins. They're really skinny type one diabetics. I don't know if you guys have heroin users here, but we had a bunch in Kentucky. So we had a lot of really skinny people that had like nothing here and we'd go for the upper arm. There's three main veins in the upper arm. There's the brachial, there's the basilic, and there's the, the cephalic. I need to really to update this video. This was uh, one of my former fellows. He's an avid mountain biker, uh, avid rock climber. This guy does not need an ultrasound guided IV. Right, I mean, look at all these veins, right? But just for an example of where they're at. So the brachial veins, there's paired brachial veins, right kind of in the center of the upper arm. And the veins, we have the, the transducer placed in the cross section. So we're looking at the veins in cross section up here. And we see three blood vessels right here. One, two, three. One of those is gonna be an artery and two are veins. I've seen a couple of times where people actually have two arteries in one vein, but for the most part, it's one artery, two veins, I'll talk about it in a bit, but you always gotta make sure that you identify this guy right here. Does anybody know what that guy is right there? No, it's a nerve, yeah, yeah, so that's the median nerve. And on, on his, his name's Ben. On Ben, his nerve is in a great spot. It's underneath his blood vessels, but many times you're actually gonna see, for me, on me for instance, my nerve is on top. So you always have to be cognizant, especially if you're going brachial, to make sure that you identify where that nerve is and don't go through a nerve, because it's, it's painful, right? You're going through a nerve. This right here is on the median side or medial side. This is the basilic vein. This is a great beginner vein, a great beginner vein because it's huge. If you have IV drug users, they, they, for whatever reason, don't find that vein very frequently. I don't know if it's more painful there or what, but that one is usually pristine in IV drug users, usually. It's nice and straight. There's no arteries next to it. There are nerves in the area, but no huge nerves that you have to worry about like the median nerve. So the medial side is great for beginners, but I'm gonna to talk to you about how once you've got a couple under your belt, I actually avoid these now. And I avoid these for a couple of reasons. And I'll talk about it in a bit. Great beginner vein. My favorite vein that is available probably, uh, I don't know, 15% of the time, it's, it's like the rarest vein to be able to cannulate, is the one on the other side of the biceps muscle, the cephalic vein. I love that one, but it's usually pretty small and very rarely it's actually the right one. But those are the three of the upper arm, brachial, basilic, and cephalic. Let's talk about how to select a good vein. So these are our goals, right? The depth is important. We want the inappropriate shallow vein, right? Because surprisingly, if you have a very shallow vein, like one that's basically like right underneath the skin surface, you actually fail at those more. Because if you puncture like, a, a, I don't know, 0.2 millimeters off, you're not gonna be able to bring the catheter like underneath it to go through it. And you might barely poke through and as you, tent the skin down and then the IV like pokes through, you might have gone through the entire vein. So you actually want one that's a little under the skin surface, but not too deep. They've actually done studies about this and the most successful uh, veins, the ones that are less likely to fail are between 0.5 and 1.5 centimeters from the skin surface. So that is gonna be your sweet spot. Less than 1.5, you increase the risk of it failing, like infiltrating, I don't know, 
us who have placed ultrasound guided IVs, one of like the things that we dread the most is we, you know, somebody has three attempts, we place the fourth one, we're super excited about it because they need to get a CT scan for a PE, and then we find out from the CT scanner, they call back and it has infiltrated, right? It's so one of the things we want to avoid, and the way we avoid that is making sure that we don't go for a super duper deep vein. Mike brought some examples of long IVs that we have. Um, there's two different long IVs. There's a the 1.2 is a standard uh, uh, width or length of the IV. We have one, uh, these are inches. We have 1.89, which are slightly longer, and then there's also two and a half inch. If you're going to go anywhere near that 1.5, I would suggest actually the two and a half inch, like a bigger IV, because you need as much of that catheter in the vein as possible. Otherwise, it's more likely to pop out. Okay. We need them to be large. The larger the vein, the better. Um, here's an example. This is, uh, I think this is my, these are my, uh, my brachial kind of bundle. And you see how like my median nerve is right on top. You guys see it right up there. Um, so this is my uh, median nerve up here. I will tell you that one of, one of these is the artery and two are the veins. Can you guys tell? The smaller one is the artery. Uh, Often. It's probably the artery. Well, we're going to actually figure that out in a bit. And I'll tell you that um, there's so much variation that just eyeballing it and saying like that one's probably the artery probably isn't enough, especially in this area. We'll talk about how to, how to not cannulate an artery by what I call landmines, right? So these are things that we don't want to go through to get to that vein. Now let's go back here. We already talked about this one right here, right? That is the nerve, we definitely don't want to go through the nerve to get to a vein, right? That would hurt really bad. But the next one's the artery. There's a, a couple of extra things that you can do. Um, on the sonocytes, it's a pretty easy button. You just hit the color Doppler and the one that's pulsatile is gonna be the artery. The ones that non-pulsatile is gonna be the vein. You can throw pulse wave Doppler on there if you want, you don't have to, but this is an arterial waveform. We see nice spikes here. And this is a venous waveform right here. What I do instead, because I don't wanna have to press extra buttons on the machine, is I look for pulsatility. Now that's important to me. People talk about compressibility, right? The vein is compressible, the artery is not. Sure, if you have somebody that has like a hypertensive emergency, their uh, arteries are super taut and you can't compress them, yeah, that happens. But oftentimes we are doing this on patients who are hypotensive, right? And their arterial pressure might not actually be enough to, to keep open those peripheral arteries. Here's an example. So one of these is the vein, one of these is the artery, and you see that with comp they're both compressible. They're both easily compressible. So I don't look for compressibility. What I look for is pulsatility. It's almost like using the Doppler. So I hold pressure, and the one that pulsates is the artery. The one that doesn't pulsate is the vein. That's how I tell the difference every single time. It's easy, right? A little bit of pressure, and you can tell. When you're choosing a vein, you don't want to have a super curvy vein. You want to find like the straightest vein possible. Here is, a, I actually cannulated this one, but, and this is me going up and down the arm, right? Trying to find the right path of that vein. Look at how curvy this is. Hmm. So you, this is not an ideal case because it's like, it's almost like one of those Gatlin guns, you know, that the, the chamber kind of like rotates like that. This would not be a good vein. You want one that you go up and down the vein or up and down the arm and the vein just stays. It just stays as a straight line. That's what you want. And then you want to uh, identify the ideal location. So here's that arm. I showed you this earlier when I was talking about how to put the um, tourniquet on. This is how I think about location, okay? Forearm, great. I always look in the forearm first. Upper arm, awesome. The reason why the antecubital fossa is not ideal is because of the path the catheter has to take to be able to get into the vein. So you think about this bend, if you're bringing in the IV this way, it's got to basically do a U, I'm exaggerating, but it's basically got to do a U to get up there, right? You're much more likely to go through that back wall if you have to kind of scoop it up. So I actually avoid the antecubital area. And then I put as yellow the uh, basilic area over here, um, yeah, on the medial side. And the reason for that, even though I just said a couple of slides ago that it is a great beginner vein, the problem is, is that it is very uncomfortable for patients to have an IV here. It's a sensitive area, and if you have a patient that's maybe like a little bit altered, they're gonna be doing this a lot, it's much more likely to kind of irritate and come out. If I put a vein, uh, IV here, like that's the only place that I can do it, I often will wrap the entire arm in Coban because um, I don't want it to come out. So that's why I say like starting out, great place, but once you like identified like you're good, you've done 20 ultrasound guided IVs, you're feeling good about it, try to go for the cephalic, try to go for that slightly more difficult brachial, leave this one. The other thing is that when patients have um, pick lines, 
or midline catheters, longer term stuff, that they usually use the cephalic, uh, the uh, basilic veins because they're easier. So I like to reserve those for other people down the road if they need like a pick line, basically. All right, beginner, great. Once you get a few, move to a different vein if you can. All right, we got our patient prepped. Oh, by the way, I talk fast just the way I am. <laughs> um, if you need clarification, you want me to repeat something, please stop me, I, I don't get offended. All right, we got our veins selected. Now we're ready to start our procedure. So this is a, this is a transducer. All transducers have that guy on there, a probe marker. The sonocytes have them as well. You always wanna identify exactly where those are because so you have your transducer here, like this. Probe marker over here, you're cannulating, you have your screen over here. You always wanna make sure that if you turn left on the screen, the needle's gonna turn left, and if you turn right, the needle's gonna turn right. So you always wanna make sure that you're oriented with that probe marker, super important. All right, let's talk about your actual approach. This, I, uh, I spent five hours doing this like, like next set of animations, by the way, so I'm like really excited to show you guys. Um, give me feedback, by the way, if you don't like it. All right, this is a vein. Okay. All right, so here is your ultrasound transducer. We have the ultrasound image on the other side of the screen. And we have to identify what the axis is. Like what is the path of that vein to be able to cannulate it successfully? Because what you don't want to do is you don't want to come in with your IV this way, right? You want to make sure to come in parallel with the path of that vein. Let's talk about how to find that. So here's the transducer and we can already see our transducer is not perpendicular to that vein. Now look what happens as I move up and down the arm. This is the vein over here on this side as well. Look what happens to the vein. You see how it's moving side to side? It's doing that because we are not perpendicular. We're kind of tilted. So it's gonna move left to right on that ultrasound screen. That's how we know we're not in the right axis. To find the right axis, you basically will rotate your transducer until you find a orientation as you go up and down the arm, where as you move, the vein is staying in the center of your ultrasound screen because, and you want this because if your transducer is perpendicular to the vein, you bring your needle in perpendicular to the probe, guess what? Your needle is gonna be parallel to that vein. So that's how you find out exactly which direction your IV is gonna go. All right, now here, my, uh, my wife was very nice to let me draw a Sharpie on her. Um, here is her, this was actually last night in the hotel room. All right, so here's the vein, there's the ultrasound clip on that side, and you'll see how initially, here's the vein up here, a little tiny vein right there. You'll see how initially my probe is not perpendicular to that vein, and you see how this vein over here is moving side to side? So this is what you do not want. You don't want to try and cannulate a vein when your probe is not perpendicular to the path of that vein. All right, and then what I'll do here towards the end of the clip is I'll rotate my transducer clockwise to basically find the appropriate path. So right here, I'm right on it. There's that little vein up there. And you see now it's staying in one spot. So now my probe is perpendicular to that vein. So if I come in with that um, IV, obviously on the other side, but if I come with that IV straight uh, perpendicular to where that probe is, I'm gonna like, almost like you're landing a plane right into that vein. There's two different approaches you can take with ultrasound guided IVs. You can take a short axis and a long axis. This is the short axis here, where you have your, your you know, cutting, cutting the vein in short axis, cutting the uh, needle in short axis as well. This is the one that I prefer. This is the one that I teach, the short axis technique. This is the other one. This is the long axis technique. If you're trained with it, you like it, you can do it this way, right? You have uh, the probe, um, long axis to the vein, you have it in long axis to the needle. I mean, it looks great. I mean, I just said I, I like short axis. I like it better than long, right? But this looks awesome, right? I mean, look at, you, you don't have to move the transducer. You see the whole thing. It, it looks amazing, right? In theory, this should be better. But in practice, it is not. The reason why is most of the time when we're doing this, it's not in veins that are nice and straight where they're curvy. So you can't get it perfectly in like the plane of the vein, because the plane isn't, the, the vein does this, right? So you can't get it in, in line number one. Number two, it's actually really difficult for me. I've done, I stopped counting after like 2000 and something, my ultrasound guided IVs I've done. It's really hard for me to have the vein, the needle, and the probe perfectly aligned in the center of the vein. It's very difficult because remember the ultrasound beam is just showing like one slice, one like millimeter slice through something, right? So here we have one in, and I can see it great, right? Great view of that uh, needle there. 
But I want you to see how on the right side of the screen, look at how subtly I'm moving my transducer left to right and how I completely lose the needle. Look at this. Barely moving it just a little bit, completely lose sight of the needle. Everything has to be perfectly aligned. And that's difficult to do. Even for a non-beginner, it's still hard for me to do, right? And then you have this, right? How are you supposed to like get the, uh, the IV perfectly like in the long axis when there is no long axis of that needle because it's so curvy, it doesn't work. This is why I like the short axis. This, the most important thing with any ultrasound guided procedure, do not advance that needle if you don't lose, if you can't see that needle tip, because that's where you cause harm. That's where you poke a nerve. That's where you poke um, a uh, uh, an artery. And to be honest, guys, like uh, I mean, guys in a general neutral way, of course, people. Um, the um, what happens if you poke an artery in a peripheral IV? What happens? It's not a big deal, right? You just take it out, a little pressure. It's fine, right? I mean, we honestly like. I think our, our, our staff who places uh, IVs, landmark based IVs regularly, they probably do it a lot. I mean, just like there's no data, but they probably do it a lot. I mean, you know, I would. What happens if you poke the carotid artery, right? What happens if you cannulate the carotid artery? You know, like, like, like if you extrapolate it, it could be a big deal. And that's why with ultrasound guided IVs, really focus on getting good technique because then you're, you're never going to mess up a central line if you're good at ultrasound guided IVs. Because here's the interesting thing. Ultrasound guided IVs, I think, are dramatically harder than ultrasound guided central lines. Dramatically harder. Central lines, piece of cake with ultrasound guidance, right? But a difficult IV access can be really hard, right? So we have a super hard procedure that has low risk. That's the one that honestly you should be training with, right? So that when you have the high risk procedure, even if it should be easier, you're much less likely to cause harm. Let's talk about actual technique, like poking that vein in here. All right, this is uh, this this is actually the one that took me a long time on the plane. So I'm happy about this one. I showed Mike and he was like, how long did it take you? Took me the whole plane ride over here. Yeah, it took me five hours. All right, so we have a transducer. We have the skin, we have the vein here, and then the green thing is like the beam, right? Now, one thing that I was taught when I was a resident was what you can do is, let's say your vein is one centimeter deep, right? Or one inch, we'll just say, just making numbers up here. One inch, and then we have over here, we can do Pythagorean theorem, go one inch back. We go to 45 degree angle. So this is where we want to cannulate. We like, we want to cannulate it right here. We go to 45 degree angle, and after you do math and stuff, like you'll, you'll get there, right? This is what I was taught. Don't do this. This is a very bad idea for multiple reasons. How many of you guys have tape measures in your fanny packs? So what, how often would you, if it's 1.2 inches deep, how, would you like say like, you take your tape measure out and measure? No, right? I, I wouldn't have time for that, right? So to have that 45 degree angle get perfect, you'd have to actually measure out 1.2 centimeters on your thing. And what happens, like I'm not a robot, you probably can do it. I don't know the difference between like 45 degrees and 50 degrees, right? And if I'm 50 degrees, then I'm gonna like, let me show you what'll happen, all right? So this is our target right here. Let's say I have it 50 degrees and sit like I've measured one inch, one inch, and let's say like I'm accidentally at 50 degrees, right? What's gonna happen is I'm gonna go all the way through and then it's gonna just pop up down there because the ultrasound beam right here, it is not moving and it's gonna finally identify when I've it's gonna tell me that I, my angle is too sharp when I'm already like way, have already gone through that entire vein, right? And then if you have it a little too shallow, this is what it'll look like, right? A little too shallow, if you keep your vein steady or your pro steady, the entire time you're running through it and going through the vein and going through the artery deep to it, all you're gonna see is this dot right here, right? Because the ultrasound beam can't tell the difference between the shaft and the tip. It looks exactly the same to the ultrasound because it's just getting one slice of something, right? Now, what I would suggest is let's say, let's go back to this one, let's say that this is the spot to cannulate. And as you do more of these, you'll see sometimes you have like a half, like a one centimeter place where that's the only place that you'll cannulate. Because let's say you're trying to get that swirly vein. That's the only spot. You can do like a hybrid, which is what I do, um, is let's say I wanna get there, I'll go that one inch back. But instead of leaving my transducer steady, I bring the transducer back to exactly where I'm starting the poke. Because remember, you always have to know that where that needle tip is. And then you advance that needle until you see that first dot. And this, there's a lot of different uh, uh, ways that people describe this technique. Some people call it a leapfrog technique. Some people call it um, dynamic needle tip positioning. 
I like call it, calling it sequential needle tip tracking because that's what we're doing. We're sequentially tracking the needle tip. I'm never moving my transducer at the same time as my needle. I'm doing one, then the other, one, then the other. This helps me know that something's needle tip. So as soon as it pops up, right? As soon as I see this little dot right here, I stop advancing the needle, move the transducer away from me until the needle tip disappears. Then advance the needle until I see it pop up on the screen, stop, move the transducer, and so on and so forth until I see myself right in the middle of that lumen. Now, we're often having to come in at a pretty sharp angle to get down to it. And let's say that, you know, this is in long axis, this is like our vein, right? If you're coming at it like this, if you advance that catheter, you might accidentally poke through that back wall. You don't want to advance the catheter when you're this sharp of an angle. So what you want to do, once you are in, your needle tip is actually in the vein, what you do is you keep doing the same thing, that sequential needle tip tracking, as you flatten the needle and continue to advance. So we're doing the same thing, and then flattening it, and then advancing. And then once I've done that, I've walked it into the vein further, then I turn around and then I slide in that catheter so I'm not accidentally poking through that back wall. We have some uh, vascular phantoms here and I'm gonna show you basically like that exact same technique. And notice my angle when I poke through the skin is pretty sharp. Poke in and then I flatten and then start advancing. You see how I'm doing one then the other, one then the other, one then the other mm. to get right into that center of the lumen. That's how you make sure that what you're seeing is that needle tip. That's the most important thing. One more example. This lady was nice enough to let me record it. This was a, a nursing home patient who fell. You can see there's already a bunch of bruising, right? She's already had multiple sticks. I actually found one pretty superficially. I'm making sure that I find the path and this particular vein was actually more uh, oblique, um, which, you know, we don't know. All right, so did you notice on my initial poke, by the way, did you see how I increased the angle, poked it, and as soon as I got into the skin, I flattened it? Mm. This is important, especially with patients with um, you know, kind of like stretchy, floppy skin, right? Because what will happen is if you um, just start at this like super shallow angle as you're going down, let's say this is a transducer, what you'll find is you'll kind of go underneath and you won't actually puncture the skin. You'll just be like sliding up above the skin, never actually puncture it. So I do a sharp poke, then flatten, then advance. And here I'm gonna do, and you see this is a pretty superficial vessel. I'm, gonna, I'm doing my sequential needle tip tracking here. You can see I'm moving that, um, the tip to make sure that I'm in the center of the vein. And then what I'm doing here, this is like an optional thing. Once I think I'm in the center, I will turn it into the long axis often to just make sure that I'm not poking through that back wall and make sure that I'm fully in that blood vessel and I'll actually visualize threading the catheter in the long axis. This is a little more of a, after you've done a few, this is uh, something that you can do on top of that just to confirm. Mm -hmm. Now, how many of us place non-ultrasound guided IVs on a regular basis? None? I, I was telling Mike, I had a shift like uh, probably three weeks ago where we had, uh, we were down like three nurses. It was, it was horrible. And so I like placed uh, non-ultrasound guided IV, IVs nine, 10, and 11. That's how many I've done in my entire life. I've now done 11 non-ultrasound guided IVs in my life, right? If you talk to someone who has placed a bunch, like our, our, our ER nurses, which are our ER nurses, anywhere I've ever worked, they're amazing at vascular access, right? They're so good at their job, right? One of the things that they struggle with is this concept, looking for a flash, like, oh, I see a flash. Don't look for a flash. After you've poked, you have your transducer there, I don't look down at the patient after that. I don't because this is a hint of what's going on, like what you're seeing on the surface, but the truth of actually what's going on inside that patient is actually on the ultrasound screen. A flash tells you that you've touched a blood vessel. It doesn't tell you that you're in the all the way in. It doesn't tell you if you've gone all the way through, right? You can have barely gotten, so remember like you have your, let's see your catheter, your actual uh, needle from the IV is this long. The catheter is this long. Right? So if you get the sharp part and you get a little bit of blood return, your catheter might not actually be in the vein yet, right? Or there's a really small vein. You got blood, but when you did this, you actually poked through the back wall, right? I never look down, I never look for a flash. I just look at the ultrasound screen. Let's talk about a couple of tips as we finish up about maximizing our success. It's just like a recap map out your path. Make sure that you know the trajectory of that vein before you cannulate. And this is just, you know, a technique stuff. And this is honestly with any, even non-ultrasound guided procedure that you do, 
make sure that you're in a, uh, you're seated, make sure that you're comfortable and brace your hands. What I see sometimes when people start is I will see them go kind of like the probe is here, they're holding at the tail and they're holding the IV like this. This is, this is not setting you up for success. When I'm doing IVs, my elbow is on something or my wrist is on the patient and then I have my IV like this and this is braced so that I have full control and my arm doesn't get tired, my probe is not gonna slip off because everything is braced. You wanna sit too, I often sit with ultrasound guided IVs. I know that sometimes we have hallway beds and it might be difficult to sit, but I sit, I try to make myself comfortable. And one other thing is the location of the screen. What you don't want, let's say the patient's laying here, head's there, feet's here, and you have the thing here, the arm here. You don't wanna have this here and then have the machine over this way. It's just a little difficult, right? It's always better to kind of have it in your line of sight so it's easier, like in a neutral kind of like C-spine position. And sometimes that even means having the transducer on the, or the, the ultrasound machine on the other side of the patient while you're on the right side to have the machine on the other side. It's all about being comfortable. That helps your success. It takes me, let's say 100 is the whole thing with ultrasound guided IVs, like start to finish. 75% of that time, I'm setting up. 25% of the time, I'm actually cannulating and taping up. Okay. Every single time that I do an ultrasound guided IV, like 95% of the time, I'm using a long catheter, even if the vein is superficial. There's no downside. The more of that catheter that you have in the vein, the less likely it is to slide out. So I always use at least a 1.89 inch catheter. And if I have availability, I'll use the two and a half inch catheter on all of them just because it's less likely to come out. If you have, we have a 2.5 inch 20 gauge and those I hesitate using just because of like physics, the more narrow the channel is, the harder it is to draw and the harder it is to push. So with 20s, I won't use the, the two and a half usually. Um, but if I can put an 18 in a vein, it's a two and a half every single time. You can easily push IV contrast through there. You can easily draw stuff out of it. Remember, the tip is the most important thing. Right? Don't lose sight of that needle tip. If you can't find it, you need to stop your procedure and find it and then continue on your procedure. And when we do the hands-on, we're gonna talk about, there's a lot of techniques that, that you can do to make sure if you happen to lose the needle tip, to go back and find it. I'm gonna leave you with a stat, all right? I started doing ultrasound guide IVs towards the end of my intern year, and these were my numbers. I failed my first 10 ultrasound guided IVs. And my first successful one at number 11. Like I mentioned, these are difficult. This is, I think that ultrasound guided IVs are the most difficult ultrasound guided procedure that exists. I do nerve blocks, I do aspirations, I do injections, I do everything ultrasound guided. I do, I do intubations ultrasound guided, by the way. When I have residents and they wanna use DL, I'll put the ultrasound machine on the patient's neck and I'll identify if they're tracheal or esophageal with the ultrasound. I do a lot of things ultrasound guided. Ultrasound guided IVs are the hardest ones. Don't let that stop you from trying. The only way to get better is to get those reps in. The first time that I looked in EKG, it was very intimidating. It's just a bunch of squiggly nines. I didn't know, I didn't know the axis, I didn't know what they meant. The second time I looked in EKG, it was still very intimidating, right? But after I've looked at a couple thousand EKGs, they're a piece of cake now. This is the same thing with ultrasound guided IVs and it will dramatically help disposition. You're gonna be able to get these patients out of ER faster and you're gonna cause significantly less pain. I hope you enjoyed that completely revised vascular access talk. It was actually super fun. I haven't given a brand new vascular access talk in actually a couple of years now. I had a fun time creating all those new graphics. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts on vascular access, your tips, your tricks. And in the meantime, don't forget to check out Sound and Surf 21 on the courses.coreultrasound.com website.